Do you know what I'm talking about this morning? Good, okay. <laughs> well, I'm going to be talking about the practical aspects of the teaching. Today's talk is one that we like to present from time to time as a reminder of the basics of the teaching. When I talk about or say the basics of the teaching, what I'm really talking about is those aspects, really basic fundamental aspects of the teaching that we can put into practice into our day-to-day -day lives. Many people translate the teachings through their psychological filter system through their philosophical filter system, or even through their religious filter system. And where this filtering system of theirs may bring them some insight and some happiness and can be of help to them, nonetheless, it is a filtering system based on their consciousness. Ultimately, this kind of filtering system distorts the teaching and frequently turns people away from the spiritual path. I'll hear people talk about a spiritual book that they're reading and they're inspired with to a point, and then they say, this is just like the teaching, or look, the teaching is here, but, and, and stay with me, you know, with this, people tend to distort an idea or a philosophy or a, even a religious doctrine because of their level of consciousness. Level of consciousness means that if they're still functioning through the controls of the subconscious mind, then those controls and the subconscious mind become part of the filter system. And as a result of this clogged filter system, then the pure and true teaching becomes distorted not only initially distorted, but over time, further and further and further distorted. So our job, those of us that practice the teaching, study the teaching, must be able to identify the pure element of the teaching and not books written by people whose consciousness has a filter system that is partially or maybe even totally clogged. So this is why I like to, from time to time, bring this lecture back into our awareness uh, to learn about you know, what the teaching is and what it isn't, but most especially what the teaching is. So let me once again remind you what the teaching is and its practical aspects, practical meaning, aspects that we can put into our life, you know, our day-to-day -day life, not just our, you know, occasional life or a particular moment that occurs in our life, but something that we can practice every single day. If a teaching is given to us that we cannot use in our daily life, then what is the use of it? It then creates imbalance in our system and can make our life very difficult. A great sage, the Master Moria, said, By your everyday life do I teach you. See, by your everyday life do I teach you. He also said, I give to you the teaching, karmic messages, instructions, 
the teaching is intended for the whole world, for all beings. The more broadly you comprehend, the more truly it is yours. See, right there, this great sage is saying, don't isolate your teaching from the rest of the world as being special or unique only to a certain body of people. He's saying that the teaching is intended for the whole world, for all beings. So we're going to watch and see if the teaching that is given to us is practical. See, this is a real key point. Is your teaching practical? What do I mean by practical? Is it helping your health, your happiness, your success, your prosperity, and your creativity? The other day I watched a YouTube video about galactic civilizations, about something called the Light Alliance. Many people are following this stream of thought because it is exciting their emotional and sentimental interests. But will it give you help when you are at the crossroads of your life? Perhaps you are interested in UFOs, which is an attention-grabbing study and has an interesting history. I know many of us here believe in UFOs, as did the founders of the Agni Yoga Society. Not only interested, but they had a few experiences which they wrote about. However, as interesting as these experiences are, <clears throat> are they practical to our life? If you are diagnosed with a serious health problem, or you are going through a painful divorce, or you have discovered your children are destroying themselves to do, due to drug abuse and addiction, will your knowledge of UFOs give you any answers how to help your children, or how to help your health crises, or how to help you through that divorce, how to build right human relations, of course, the answer would be no. Even studies of cosmos, if not practical, can be of no help to you in any practical sense until you put your life in order. So what is the teaching? It is a body of practical rules that is derived from the laws of nature. If we follow these laws, then we will become successful. These laws are understood through common sense. The teaching explains common sense is the application of the laws of nature to make yourself happy, healthy, prosperous, and creative. On my way over this morning, driving over here, I was listening to the TED Talks on NPR. And this wonderful man was talking about the importance of clouds. And he even formed a cloud society, which he said after he gave his lecture, so many people joined. And as I'm driving the car, you know, I all of a sudden start looking at these wonderful, beautiful clouds. I even looked over and I saw Thumb Butte, our signature mountain of Prescott, and had never seen that particular view of Thumb Butte as I'm driving along. <laughs> but what really touched me in his talk was how slowing down for a few minutes. You can go out into your backyard, 
pull out a chair, and just enjoy the clouds. And I was thinking about how Kathy, Kathy actually knows quite a bit of cl about clouds. She studied clouds. And he was talking a little bit about cirrus clouds, which I know very little about except what he shared in his TED talk. But I was thinking how clouds, being able to see different images and uh, fantasies in clouds inspires or ignites our imagination. And it, for maybe even a short period of time, deletes all of our worries and uh, our concerns and our fears and feeds a hungry soul. So if you're not a meditator, if you say, I can't meditate, my mind is so busy all the time. Go out to your backyard, sit in a chair just for a few moments and enjoy the different formations of clouds. He said that usually we're so busy, you know, with our day-to-day -day life uh, that the only time we enjoy clouds is when there aren't any, <laughs> when there's the blue sky. <laughs> So he's changed, just, just in those few minutes driving over here, you know, he's changed my whole perspective of clouds. Okay, so what do clouds have to do with the teaching and making yourself happy and prosperous and more creative and healthy and so forth is because we set aside our mundane thoughts just for a little while. So notice the clouds rolling in today that will be full of snow tomorrow. <laughs> Oftentimes, ignorance of some people studying the teaching believe that the ageless wisdom is about having psychic abilities. Yet the path of Agni Yoga says this, and I'm going to quote, directly quote from Agni Yoga. This is from Fiery World 2. The saints of great service have no psychism because they are always striving in spirit towards hierarchy and their heart resounds to the anguish in the world. Psychism is a window into the subtle world, the astral world, but the teacher tells the pupil, do not turn so often to that window. Instead, look into the book of life. He says, often psychism, the great sage, often says, often psychism proves to be a weakening influence. But the great service is found in straight knowledge. Therefore, we warn against psychism, against turning one's gaze backwards without a definite object for the future. Verily, in the great service is the feeling of great responsibility. So here's a question you can ask anyone who speaks about the teaching. The first question can be, can this teaching change your life and improve it. You see, if the teaching cannot improve your life and make you a more efficient and responsible person, then it is the wrong one. It is not the true teaching, the perennial teaching. Taking responsibility means just that. Don't give the responsibility to somebody else. Take it on yourself. Agni Yoga gives us some traits that we can see in those who are actually practicing the true teaching. So let me share some of these traits with you and then I'll get on to some of the exercises 
uh, or application of the teaching that we can put into our lives. In Infinity 2, it says there are three traits of character that we find in people who are practicing the teaching. The first is the trait of honesty. The second is the trait of self-abnegation. And the third is the trait of service. The manifestation of each trait will give the spirit the sword against egotism. And in that same book, Infinity 2, verse 502, it says, those in our service who have realized the power of sacrifice know about the beauty of achievement. Therefore, they who will achieve are those who have realized the service in their hearts. Thus, service in the name of the powerful achievement bestows beauty upon their existence. Thus, lives are being built, and beauty of Venus is defined. Then Hierarchy, the book Hierarchy 196. You may be asked how the entrance upon the path of service is defined. Certainly the first sign is renunciation of the past and full striving to the future. The second sign will be the realization of the teacher within one's heart not because it is necessary thus, but because it is impossible otherwise. The third sign will be the rejection of fear. For being armed by the Lord, one is invulnerable. The fourth will be non-condemnation because he who strives into the future has no time to occupy himself with the refuse of yesterday. The fifth will be the filling of the entire time with labor for the future. The sixth will be the joy of service and completely offering oneself for the good of the world. The seventh will be spiritual striving to the far off worlds as a predestined path. According to these signs, you will discern a spirit ready and manifested for service. He will understand where to raise the sword for the Lord, and his word will be from within his heart. And then one more. This is from, again from Hierarchy, verse 460. Willing service, a heartfelt veneration, and conscious assent will bring one to the threshold of light. So those are the traits that we can recognize in those who are putting the teaching into practice. Now here are a few things that we can practice from the teaching that will change our life, change your life. Uh, practical means you can practice these exercises in your office, in your home, in your family, and in your society. So if they're practical, that means that just that. You know, first of all, it doesn't mean that we have to wear saffron robes to practice the teaching. Uh, we don't have to act weird just to prove that we're in the teaching. Uh, we don't have to talk and use language that is so <clears throat> esoteric or so esoteric 
I want to use the word bizarre, but I don't want to use the two words together. <laughs> but they're so esoteric that, that you lose the attention, you know, of the people that are observing you and wanting to know who you are and where does your knowledge come from? Because they see something different in you. See, the, in my opinion, people who live the teaching are different from a mediocre person. You know, people who live the teaching are not mediocre people. And I don't mean that in a separative way. I mean it in a factual way. God never intended people to be mediocre. If he did, why have so many millions of people born onto this planet just to be mediocre? It doesn't make sense. And so we have the lords of Shambhala. We have the great ones of hierarchy. We have Christ that formulates these wonderful teachings, gives us direction to pull us out of mediocrity and to live a life that we were intended to live at the moment of birth. Okay, so here's the first practice. Do not hang on others but provide for your own needs through your own labor and service. Depend upon yourself. See your needs and then try to provide for them instead of hanging onto others. So, you know, there can be an argument for this, and I certainly came up with a number of them. But what neutralizes that argument is we're talking now about people who are not living a mediocre life. We're talking about people stepping into leadership positions, leadership roles, and taking on leadership responsibilities. So as we prepare ourselves for community service, for group work, we must first learn to be self-sufficient. If we go into group work and community service expecting others to serve us, we will quickly create tension with our co-workers or any kind of relationships that we have, including with our families and friends. Hanging on to others, in other words, weakens us. It makes us a dependent human being. When we depend on ourselves, we slowly, slowly dig out the potentials that were hidden within ourselves and not used. You will be surprised how you can do much better than others if you awaken the potentials that are within you. Sometimes leaders, teachers, even parents try to make people hang on to them so that they can exploit them. They are secretive. They hold things back from their co-workers or committee members so they can act superior to them. This is a very dangerous practice and goes against the principle of freedom and beauty. The second Energy. Do not waste your time and energy. Your body, your emotions, your mind, your brain are your capital. If you are wasting these things, you are not going to have future capital to use when your old age comes. Those who waste their youth in excessive pleasure pass their old age in poverty and sickness. 
You have $5,000, but you wasted it. So you do not have money to live on in the future. My teacher told his students one day that his father took, told him something that he should never forget. He said, father took him outside into nature and under a tree said, never forget this. When you are young, live like an old man so that when you become an old man, you live like a young man. And that is what he did. So we must economize our energies. Saving our energy and using it creatively brings happiness. Wasting it leads to sickness, unhappiness, and defeat. Of course, every one of us knows this in our heart. Number three, when you are young, this is very much like number two, when you are young, think about your old age. What are you going to do in your old age? Few people think about this until they become old. <laughs> then they start thinking and what happens is they panic. So instead, start when you are young. Think, how can I make my old age really beautiful, really healthy, really prosperous, and a blessing for others? And when you are older, think about a possible future birth. Actually, everyone, all of humanity, should think about their next life. Whether there is a next life or there is not does not matter. Even if you decide to think there is no next life, then look at your children. Your children are your next life. Your children and grandchildren and nieces and nephews and so forth are going to inherit that world. Or you yourself are going to inherit that world. The people who do not think about the future will not have a future. The fourth, the teaching encourages us not to borrow money from our bank or from our credit cards. Instead, spend your money economically so that tomorrow you will not have to beg. It is interesting how youngsters will say, Give me $5. Well, in today's society, they will ask for more. They will ask for $50. I remember when I lost a tooth when I was a little girl, you know, really little girl, I would get 10 cents under my pillow. Now, it's $5, it's $10, or it's an IOU. <laughs> Truly, I've heard stories. <laughs> Kids see something that they want and they get excited. So they want more money and then they spend it. But then they do not have money once again. Often, ad adults oftentimes do the same thing. However, with adults, as they continuously find themselves in financial problems, it eats away at their confidence levels and they begin to go downhill, continually worrying about the lack of money. From the beginning, it is better to teach children to economize. If you have money, you can spend it. But if you are smart, spend it so that in the future you are not in a position of having to borrow from others. What I am saying is a simple and straightforward truth. I do know that in our present economy, it is becoming increasingly difficult for middle-income families to survive economically. Increasing health care costs, food costs, heating and cooling costs, insurance, and more. Even for us as a group, you know, postage, when postage goes up the way it is, 
it's a has a big impact you know on our budget like with our prisoners program a uh, prisoner sends us a letter first of all we have to open the envelope and read it there's taking time and energy from our staff then he says I want to be put on the list to receive Meditation Monthly International. Okay, there's some more money because we have to print it out from our very expensive laser colored printer. And then they want a meditation course. Meditation courses may be 15 to 20 to 25 pages long. We have to print all of that out. And then we have to put this heavy mailing, you know, into an envelope and send it to them. You know, all of this costs money, and it starts with this increase of postage. So this is why, you know, I, I want to say that, you know, I'm not ignorant of how challenging it is economically to live in, in today's society. As I was listening to an author interviewed on NPR this past Monday, she talked about the high percentage of senior citizens in poverty that where people used to retire at 65 and die at 70, now they are living another 30 years. The author's name is Isabel Alande. She was born in Peru, raised in Chile, and is presently living in California, and she's 73. She has written eight novels and several for children. She is highly creative, very practical, and naturally spiritual. So the reason I even wanted to share this morning, share this this morning, is here is this highly spiritual published author who has written not only eight novels for adults, and they're magnificent, I'm reading one now, about her life story called Paula, but also she's written children's stories. And here she is giving us statistics about the reality of senior citizens in today's world. And I, we all know senior citizens that are in economic trouble. So what do we do? We can no longer live with the same attitude that we had in our 20s. We just can't. If we do, we're going to become severely depressed because our dreams will not be realized. See, because when we were 20, you know, where society, where humanity was then, is very different from now. It's like, you know, even this country that historically has been a wealthy country, we're now $19 trillion in debt. I can't even imagine, personally, a debt of that enormity. Each person's economic situation is different, but each person must try to approach their aging years from a most practical approach, see, not from fantasy. So where I don't have all the answers, the simple approach is this, live within your means and try hard not to borrow money or to use credit cards that will bankrupt you. The fifth Sleep early and wake early. <laughs> when you stay up late, what are you doing? List the things that you are doing when you are up late. Late for me is anything after 9.30 at night. So, <laughs> I know, I used to go to bed at midnight. No way can I do that anymore. <laughs> but anyway, just list out the things, you know, for a month of what you do between, let's say, 10 and midnight or 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning. And you may be surprised. When you go to sleep, you are in the tide of the higher world. So listen to this carefully. When you go to sleep, you are in the tide of the higher worlds. When the dark of night comes, then meetings are opened or opening in the subjective world. These meetings during winter normally start at 10 o'clock in the evening and end at 4. In the summer, it's 9 to 3. 
Do not miss these experiences by wasting your time and watching television. Sometimes people go to sleep with the television on. What happens? The content of the programs go into their subconscious mind and eventually, eventually program that subconscious mind and prepares that person for a miserable future life. If we go to sleep early and get up early, first of all, what do you do? You hear the beautiful songs of birds. You inhale the freshness of air. Hear the silence and sometimes even see the stars. Especially if you live in the country and away from the pollution of cities. A proverb says, all successful people awaken early. Number six, never start your day without first praying or meditating or look at the clouds. Or at least reading something that is very beautiful. This mobilizes your higher forces. It mobilizes your higher forces and your soul and makes you ready for the fight of the day. <laughs> Number seven, never go to sleep without self-examination or evening review. Sleep is like taking off in an airplane. Before you fly, you must prepare the airplane. Those who fly without doing self-examination get caught up in turbulence. Sometimes they fall in their sleep and awaken. Why is it that sometimes we suddenly jerk and awaken? Because we were caught in turbulence. There was something that we did not adjust here and there. We were caught in the turbulence and thrown back into our bed again. And number eight, Try to develop humility and control over your mouth. I think that's the hardest thing in the world to learn. How much to say and what to say. Most people's failures, complications, and hindrances are the result of not knowing what to say and how to say it. It is your words our words that control our future, our relationships with people, our success and creativity. So these are just eight rules taken from the teaching plus the traits that I shared from the Agni Yoga books. Try to apply these in your life according to what and how you understand and according to your circumstances. And then teach them to your children and to your grandchildren. Which I had an opportunity to do yesterday. But we're out of time. It was a great Apple story, but I'll wait and share it another time. <laughs> OK, so that's the practical aspects of the teaching. So I hope you really think about this. You know, and when, when people ask you, what do you study? Now you have a more specific, you know, answer to give them. <laughs>